Good evening. You're watching the Digital Age, and I've got a great show for you tonight with Frank Rich, the New York Times columnist. He's written a book called The Greatest Story Ever Sold. We want to ask him why the press bought this story, and the story is, of course, about the selling of the Iraq War. Frank, welcome. Nice to be here, Jim. I'm going to give you a little bit of an academic exercise. OK. Can you tell us, in four or five sentences, what is the greatest story ever sold? I think I can do it maybe in two sentences, but who's counting? <laughs> um, I think the greatest story ever sold, or at least in the context I'm using it, is this fictional story the Bush administration told the American people uh, that took us to war in Iraq, a country that, as the president himself admitted this September, had nothing to do with 9-11. But by ginning up a story about alleged connections between Saddam Hussein and the hijackers of 9-11 and about weapons of mass destruction, particularly nuclear weapons for which there was no evidence, uh, they sold uh, this country on a war that, of course, is now blown up in everyone's face. Uh, how do they sell it? They sold it with sort of Orwellian techniques of relentless repetition of a few tropes. For instance, Vice President Cheney constantly alluding to a supposed meeting that never happened, as it, as it turned out, between Mohammed Atta and Iraqi security people in Prague in the month before 9-11. And then this constant drumbeat of scary phrases, uh, the smoking gun will, could be a mushroom cloud, he's going nuclear, he's securing uranium from Africa. It was so effective that by the time we invaded Iraq, uh, polls show that Americans who, who at, right after 9-11, very few thought... Eight percent, I think you say. Yeah, thought that yeah. Uh, there was any connection uh, between uh, Iraq and 9-11. By the time we went to war, almost half thought all the hijackers were Iraqis, when, of course, none of them were. And uh, it, it, it was absolutely relentless, and it was, and it was planned. It wasn't, you know, improvised, off-Broadway production. It was a real uh, spectacle. And Andrew Card said in August of 2002 that, um, I can't remember the exact quote. Well, he said you don't roll out a new product <laughs> in August. <laughs> you know? When Elizabeth Miller of the Times asked him what's going on with Iraq. Now, one of the things I tried to do in this book was, with what we know now, connect the dots of what was going on at any given time. And that's a perfect example. At that point, as we approached Labor Day of uh, 02, Officially, the Bush administration was saying there were no plans to go into war in Iraq. But we now know, as Andy Card said that to the Times, we know the Downing Street memo was in July that, that uh, summer. And where what was that memo? That memo was the head of British intelligence coming from meetings in Washington, right. reporting back to the Blair government. The Bush administration was determined to fix the facts and intelligence around the predetermined policy of going to war in Iraq. We also know that summer that uh, the White House started something called WIG, the White House Iraq Group, to sell the war. And on that, in that group were salesmen as well as policy people, people like Karen Hughes and Mary Madeline and Karl Rove. Um, it was also that summer that uh, Dick Cheney started talking ominously about Iraq going nuclear. So they were indeed planning to roll out uh, uh, that product, and that fall they did. Well, they, I think they may have moved troops. Uh, they may have been moving troops, troops as in, well. In the summertime, and that... Uh, uh, Even earlier, I think. And earlier moved the troops, and, they, and they, they had to put them into action before the really bad heat came, so they were sort of boxed in on their own Right, yet maintaining schedule, right? this uh, fiction that uh, no decisions right. have been made. But the whole thing, it wasn't for coincidence that it was the fall of 02. There were midterm elections that year. They wanted to gin things up in such a way that Congress would be panicked, particularly Democrats, and didn't want to look weak on national security in the aftermath of 9-11, and would sign on, as indeed they did that October, to the resolutions um, authorizing the, uh, the war. Oh, which raises the question, which you partially answered, why did, why did they want to go to war against Iraq if, in fact, they were ginning up uh, the information. I'm not going to say they knew they were lying about the information, but they must have had some doubts about it at the very least. Why did they want to go to a war 
against Iraq so much? Well, that's the sixty-four thousand dollar question. That's why I asked it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, um, I think it was George Packer, the writer, said that uh, uh, this is the Rashomon of wars. We know, and I have my own theories, which are only that. We may have to wait for history to tell us, but we know that. Uh, there was, of course, a neoconservative contingent within uh, the Bush administration that was dead set on going to war in Iraq even before 9-11. We also know, though, from Bob Woodward and others that, that Bush did not immediately sign on to this after the 9-11 attacks. Something happened uh, in late 01 and early 02. My own theory is, at that time, we had won the war we should have been fighting, the war against the Taliban, or we thought we had won it. We knocked them out. We'd also, unbeknownst to the American public, um, lost Osama bin Laden in December 01 in the hills of Tora Bora. O2 arrives, and that war is sort of fading. And my feeling is that, that something happened, and we don't know what, that made Bush sign on that this was just, they thought this was going to be a cakewalk. It'd be like Reagan going into Granada. They would go in, knock out this dictator that everyone rightly hated. Uh, have very few casualties, very few costs, and sort of have it as an add-on. And it served all sorts of purposes, including political purposes in the midterm election year. And I think if they had known that it was going to blow up in their faces, uh, they wouldn't have done it. But they didn't even think about what would happen, the, the, as we know, the morning after Saddam was taken out. How did they sell this to Powell? Well, according to Powell's... Or we'll put it the other way around. How did Powell buy it? Well, there again, we don't really know uh, everything. We do know that Powell himself has said this is a blot on his record. We know that uh, from his assistant, uh, Larry Wilkerson, that the night before he gave the speech to the UN, he was sitting with his group in the Waldorf Towers in New York, throwing stuff out of the speech that he knew was bogus, that he knew uh, was weak. He obviously felt that the rest of it was sufficiently questionable that as he is, I believe he has said, he made George Tenet sit behind him in the television shot to, um, uh, you know, let, let him take co-responsibility uh, for it. So why, he, how he allowed himself to be used, he's got to tell us. He hasn't yeah, yet. But he's going to tell us, I suppose, at some point in time. He's, he's going to. His yeah. whole reputation in history depends on it. His, uh, people around him are already talking about it. It's only a matter of time uh, that I would think before he uh, explains it all. How did they sell it to Congress? Well, we had a Congress. Let's talk about the Democrats here because that's they're really the key key ones. We had a Congress that was really not at all diligent. There, there are exceptions. There were people who were strong voices questioning the war in the Senate and particularly in the House. But for the most part, People just went along with it, including many who are now candidates for president. Uh, Tom Daschle, who then led uh, the Senate uh, House, uh, excuse me, the Senate Democrats, um, said at the time, we just want to get this like off the table and get going so we can talk about the economy uh, in the election, because, you know, it's the economy stupid was their issue. So they, they just uh, really kind of rubber stamped it. Well, when, uh, when they decided to go to war, actually Congress was asked to give the president authority to right. use whatever force was necessary in Iraq. Congress received a national intelligence estimate, or the Senate did, I guess. Right. Uh, we call that the NIE. Right. Okay. Uh, am I right in um, thinking that the senators didn't read it in large part? You're completely Is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> Could it, it be? They're going. They're going. Going to war for all practical purposes, and they don't read the reasons for going to war. Well, you're absolutely right, and it, and this is a crucial part of the story. Just so we should explain the NIE uh, to those who don't know, is something that can be commissioned that is the consensus of all the intelligence uh, agencies within the government, however many there are, more than a dozen. Um, the White House didn't even request one about Iraq, which just shows how much they the really White House could. didn't request an NIE. It was, re it was requested by Congress. I see. It arrived yeah. in the Senate October 1st of 02, 
And we now know, thanks to Paul Pilar, who was the head at the time of the Middle East desk at the CIA because of a piece he wrote for Foreign Affairs this year, the congressional staffers told him only 10 members of the Senate of either party read past the executive summary. Or the other, and, and only if you read past the executive summary would you see a lot of the caveats about the evidence of going to war. What, uh, one thing I'm not clear about is did the Senate get the full NIE or was something held back? I'm not sure either. I think they did. I th you think you got the whole thing? I think they the did. Public didn't, that's the public did. Sure. Oh, the public didn't. The public, public got just got a little summary redacted. Afterwards. Yeah. 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 But no, the uh, it's my impression that the Senate had the whole thing, and there was an executive summary that that uh, hit the the stuff that was most yeah. uh, you know uh, sort of pro WMD, <coughs> and then there was much more to come. The whole thing was flawed anyway, thrown together very quickly and sloppily at the last minute, but there's, that's no excuse for not reading it. Yeah, we've, I've done some programs on this with people who are intelligent experts, and therefore I've had occasion to read what's available to the public. And uh, for your, not for your edification, but for the audience edification, the way it was written, it was, my hands are supposed to be the main text. Right. And then there was, a, then there are large footnotes in which everything that's said in the main text <laughs> is sort of taken back. Well, we're not sure about this. We're right. not sure about that. So in order to uh, have a reasoned view of what you're presented with, you have to not only read the main part, which the center is, but you have to read the, read the footnotes. I want to come back to this at the very end uh, when I want to ask you, could this ever happen again? Uh, but I want to ask you a different question now. In fact, it's the key question of the program. Why did the, why did the, why did the press buy it? Well, again, history is going to tell us a lot, but I have my oh, own I want theory. you. I want, uh, but I want you to right. tell me. <laughs> well, well, this is, by the way, you know, this is a uh, history. Uh, I'm uh, trying to write it as it, history. It's, it's interesting because, excuse me for interrupting, but uh, I just want to give you a plug on your book no, here. I'm not going to show it to the camera again, but uh, at, the, at the end, you've got a huge list of events. Gosh, it must go on to, for 50 pages. More than, yeah. Yeah, and it, it's great fun to read sort of original source material for uh, current history, which I think this really is a current history. You have the advantage of looking back, and therefore, well, I, why did the press buy it, looking well, back? Looking back, I think, uh, first of all, the press is human. The press is like uh, uh, anyone else in America. The 90% of the country that rallied around Bush after 9-11, the 90-plus percent that supported the Afghanistan war, we were in shock. We were shell-shocked, like the public. And there was this rallying effect, and I understand it, but at a certain point, the press has to snap back and, and return to the default mode, which is one of questioning, skepticism, serving as a check and balance in our system. Uh, some people did. There, were, there was some accurate and skeptical reporting. For that, example? For example, there were, there were writers who, as our public editors pointed out, were buried uh, their stories were often buried in the Times and the Washington Post, like Jim Risen in the Times, Walter Pincus in the, in the Washington Post, who were on to questions about WMD. What was then the Knight Ritter Washington Bureau, since bought, it's now um, uh, McClatchy newspapers, the reporters there who were consistently uh, right about questions within the intelligence community about, uh, community about how intelligence was being used and manipulated by the administration. Why didn't we notice it? Some people feel it's because Knight Ritter newspapers like the Miami Herald and the Philadelphia Inquirer were not in New York and Washington and so it just passed under uh, the radar screen. But there was some, uh, and then we had of course Bigfoot reporters at, at several institutions including ours that credulously repeated RSV. Uh, the New York Times, New York Times yes. uh, uh, evidence uh, that would of be, the, now would be Judy, and, and would be Judy own, Miller. Yes, uh, <coughs> about um, uh, aluminum tubes and their viability and so I on. I want to ask you something that's not in your book. Yeah. Could it be possible, there's a dirty little secret here about the Washington Post and the New York Times. I'll tell you what I think it might be. But I want to point out before getting to that, you uh, put a lot of emphasis on 24-hour news, and I want to talk to you about that. Sure. Um, but I think it's fair to say, even though we have 24-hour news and the Washington Post, New York Times have a 24-hour website, right? That the the printed the print the old-fashioned printed thing that people still read 
has a lot uh, to do with setting the agenda, and, and, and it's important. Sure. And now, here's my dirty little secret question. The Washington Post institutionally was pro-war. It supported the war. Now, the New York Times changed editors in the middle of this, this event because Hal Raines had to resign because of the Jason Blair incident. And the new editor came in, who used to sit where you are now right. sitting as a columnist, right. <clears throat> and he was pro-war. Now, let me just ask you now, if you're writing a whole lot of columns, and you're pro-war, and now you're, you're going to cover the war, do you have a conflict of interest? Isn't that very difficult for you to be fair? Potentially you could, but I don't buy the theory. In the, case, the post I can't answer for. I don't know the connection between... I would, <coughs> I would like to believe and assume, as they say, that there's a real separation between the editorial page and um, the news operation. Howell Raines... Um, who was editor, as you said, really during much of this reporting, it was, it was under his regime, not uh, uh, Bill Keller's, was hardly ran a pro-Bush editorial page. So be, that doesn't uphold the theory. <laughs> and while, and, and I really, um, much of the stuff that went down in the Times happened before Bill took over, and I have not seen any evidence to suggest uh, any connection between his views, which were hardly gung-ho about the war, just were entertaining the possibility in our coverage. By the time he took over, our, our big mistakes had been made anyway, so he wasn't even a part of it. So I don't think, I don't think that's right. Okay, so um, then let's In either case, yeah, okay, do I fine. think there's a connection. Okay. So let's ask ourselves uh, what happened, as you just pointed out a few minutes ago, at each paper, which was when there were questions raised about weapons of mass destruction. Uh, the aluminum uh, tubes, tubes, particularly, right. and the aluminum tubes to refresh the re refresh the recollection of the uh, audience. If I can refresh my own recollection, was a story that uh, said Iraq had bought aluminum tubes from uh, Niger, and that they were going to be used for uh, well, it's two separate mass, things. Mass, there, mass, there, sure. there were straight me out. Okay, and, and we don't have to go into it in yeah. tedious detail, but. There was a, we ran a story on the front page in September of 02 that said that they were securing some aluminum tubes that might be able to u enrich uranium. Yeah. It was a separate story, uh, not that story, the whole issue about uh, uh, uranium, which then could be enriched. Yeah, okay. And yeah. it turned out yeah. the aluminum I mixed them tubes. Up. Okay, yeah. I combined but anyway, them too. But um, why did it happen? I, I don't really... Well, let me just yeah, uh, yeah. put the question to you, because you said earlier that uh, the stories that the Times ran later, after the front page story, and the Washington Post later, uh, by Walter Pincus and by whomever, Risen, they were, you quote, buried. That's what you said there. They weren't now, necessarily now, they, later. They were often simultaneously. But they were on, they were on, in fact, I think I remember the name of the number of the page, like page 17. How do you explain a mindset that was apparently the same at the Washington Post as the New York Times that would take the disclaimer or the story that broke the back of the original front page story, and why does it get pushed way in the back? Well, you know, how, do you, how do you explain Dan that? Dan Okrent, the public editor of the <clears throat> Times, couldn't explain it. The Post hasn't explained it. And let me just broaden it a bit. Let's, there was a real psychology afoot. For instance, right before we invaded Iraq in March of 03, Mohammed al baradai of the International Atomic Energy, uh, 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 whatever it's called, agency, announced publicly that documents that were thought to be the main proof that Saddam Hussein was securing uranium from Africa were blatant forgeries. People's names were wrong. Their titles were wrong. He announced this. None of the three networks covered it in their evening news shows. Let's leave cable news yeah. out of it. None of them did it at 6.30. The Times, uh, the Washington Post, and I think the LA Times put on the front page. The Times covered it, but on a on a um, back page. Back page. Yeah. This was consistently the case. It's almost like people, people are going to look back at this period. This is the kind of the mood I've tried to capture in this book and say, what in God's name was going on? Because it was almost like a will to suspend a, a disbelief. And it, it was so broad, and not just the Times, the Washington Post, but the major networks, and for that matter, every major mainstream news organization in the country, um, 
that it was like it was a it was a fever, and I think it could not have happened without 9/11 before it. 9/11 created a kind of atmosphere, uh, and plus yeah. the White House trumped up fear of all kinds. Where were you on all this? Excuse me, interrupting. I was on. a skeptic. Yeah, yeah I was. I well, was. If you're a skeptic, why can't everyone else be a skeptic? There were there were, and I'm not so unique. There were there 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 were yeah. other skeptics. Um, but a lot of liberals uh, supported the war, a lot of liberal commentators. Uh, I question now if they're the people we should listen to for advice on how to get out of it. But there was this gung-ho uh, uh, feeling. You say that uh, one of the factors in the selling of this to the, to the press and the purchase by the press of this uh, message was the uh, fact that the news business had sort of changed in 1992, say. Right. And that the uh, news media rode the shark of 24-hour news, which required the beast to be fed. What do you mean by that? What I mean is that in the mid-90s, suddenly we went from having one cable news network, CNN, to having many more, not just MSNBC and Fox, but also you know court TV and financial TV and all this stuff. Internet became a mass medium. The major news organizations went on the Internet. And it something changed. It used to be when Ted Turner began CNN, it really was like a headline service. It was a, a series of discrete stories over and over and over again. With the first Gulf War in 91, what turned CNN around as a business was the discovery that you could turn it into a continuing drama, even if you didn't know what was happening, because we knew almost nothing that was going on in that war while it was going on. But it became on CNN the war in the Gulf. It had a theme music, it had a logo, go through the O.J. Simpson, the Clinton scandals, everything is covered like this, and people want drama, and it's right, this medium was right to be manipulated by an administration that believes in good versus evil, that blanches out all grays, everything is black versus white, and Armageddon is around the corner. And I think to a certain extent, uh, they could play this this new 24-7 world in a way that had never had been done before. When people say about the Bush administration, well, a lot of its techniques of message management are, we remember them from Mike, Mike Deaver and Reagan, true, but that's like the silent movies versus, <laughs> you know, <laughs> CinemaScope and Dolby <laughs> Sound and moment. digital, you know, effects and everything else. And every th they knew how to play it, and they knew that, the, you know, in, the, in Vietnam, for instance, the footage, the film, had to be flown to oh, Thailand. Yeah. You know, it was everything was delayed. <clears throat> we only had 15-minute news at 6:30 national news. Now things can be repeated over and over again, and nuance and questions can be drowned out very easily. Well, I want to ask you. I think we've. I don't want to sound too pro, uh, anti Iraq to try to be balanced about it. But it seems to me, if we look at the elections which have recently taken place, right. Uh, there's a large percentage of the American public, uh, over 55 percent, uh, voting and probably higher in the polls that thinks that this was a mistake. Right. Well, you've laid out um, some of the reasons that the administration was able to sell this, right. including the 24-hour 24 24-hour 24 news, including the 9-11. Uh, uh, but I want to ask you, could this, let's say, this mistake, can we call it a mistake, could this mistake happen again? I fear so because this country has notoriously no memory. Uh, everyone thought Vietnam couldn't happen again. And while this isn't exactly a replay of Vietnam, there are enough mistakes that have repeated themselves that that never again was uh, uh, forgotten. I think uh, the press has learned a lot from its errors and is quite chastened. And we've seen a much better and more aggressive press in the past year to at, at all these institutions, not just at the Times, but you know, network news and so on. But will this pass? I don't. I don't know. And the public also has to step up at the plate. You know, one of my points is that we get up in arms that there's uh, E. coli in our spinach. We've got to start looking at the toxins that are in our information stream. People have to be more critical. Uh, have more of a Consumer Reports attitude about what about how they use news media uh, in the same way that even people can check out how they're going to buy a toaster oven. People have to be, be more skeptical. The public, 
is a big part of this too. Well, the public has is, is, uh, got to be information smart. Mm -hmm. Hard for the public to be, particularly back, back then. Of course, looking at the, the comparabilities or the similarities that we would have today or tomorrow, if this happened again, we still have the 24-hour news. Let's leave the internet out for a sure. moment. The 24-hour news TV business, which you say uh, is essential if you're dead on arrival. That's not your exact words. If you don't make it on a 20, that's still there. It still can be manipulated. So, well, it's really it's, well. The, well, yes. You know, I mean, that's, we have that's going to be hard to stop. Right. Yeah. We have to remember that in the case of Iraq, we did have a perfect storm. We had the press that fell down on the job. We had Congress that fell down on the job right. and an opposition party right. that fell down on the job and we had everyone in shock from 9-11. Those circumstances, I hope, will be hard to replicate any time too soon. We have to now learn the lessons going forward and that's a worst case scenario, but let's, we, the public is, I, I, and maybe the public has learned something. I think, you know, I end my book with Katrina because I think that's when the public got disillusioned not just with the Bush White House, but with the war. They saw suddenly this huge discrepancy between their government saying everything's hunky-dory and going to be fine and uh, stuff that was not fine, chaos, panic, and, and, and so on. And so I'm hoping this will linger, and I hope also that the younger generation that came of age in this will learn something and help reform some of the media yeah. too. Well, I want a quick question because we've come to an end, but it seems to me there may be one difference here, and the internet is a lot more powerful than it was in 2001. Mm -hmm. And it's conceivable that the press, and uh, that the public rather, will become more informed and more consumer report oriented. Uh, well, and that might shift the balance. Well, that's a very good point because yeah. the internet can be a good watchdog yeah. on all the right. press. And look, back in 9-11, there weren't photo cell right. phones. I mean, yeah. things are moving so, so maybe quickly. that's some. Well, it's I can go on all day, <laughs> and that's a digital age point I just made. <laughs> so, uh, why did the press buy it? In one or two words, I think uh, getting with the program of a president, the country was rallying around when the press, like the rest of the public, was in shock of this of this brutal attack on America. And maybe because there is no big time internet, but maybe not. <laughs> hey, Frank Rich, thanks for coming thanks by. Thanks for having me, yeah. Jim. And thank you for coming by. And come by next week and learn more about the digital age. It's a great age. And for the digital age, I am James Goodale. Good night.